I was talking to you before about this. So you initially came from uh, straight out of college. You went to what college? Mount Sierra College. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a graphic design degree. So I actually met a guy there by the name of Ruben Apodaca. And he worked in the the Nine Old Men, the original Nine Old Men for Disney. And uh, he kind of pushed me towards animation. And that's when I started falling in love to animation instead of, you know, just random design. Great. Because you came initially from like more of a design, like traditional artwork background, right? Definitely. So, yeah. Um, Doing everything by hand, 2D animation. Yeah. You know. Did you get like cells, stuff like that as well? Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Painted a bunch of cells. Um, mostly flipping though, mostly mm-hmm. on paper. You know. Cool. And um, from there, like, did you study 3D? Like, did you always want to do 3D, or how did you kind of? No. I love 2D. I, lo- I still love 2D, and I think there's something really unique about 2D. And 2D artists are amazing, just putting that out there. But right now, um, what happened is that, you know, he showed me animation, he showed me 2D animation, and he said, you should use the skills that I'm teaching you now into, you know, tools that are being used for the future. Mm-hmm. And so he said, you should try learning 3D. So I, what I did was I got, I went up to the dean and I told them uh, if they can skip me towards the 3D uh, department instead of taking all the necessary classes to get to it. So by the first year of my college, I was already doing 3D, and so I fell in love with it. You know, not having to redraw the character over and over and over again, try to keep that consistency. So. 3D was natural, man. It was just beautiful. It was like, you have this model right here, you can squash and stretch and keep the volume still. It's like stop motion, like, as long as you got it, it's a physical set, so you're exactly. not having to fucking redraw it every time. And right. A little twin. Um, so for all those lazy animators out there, 3D! <laughs> That's good. Well, so um, what I kind of like is the fact that you pretty much graduate from college and go straight into working. Well, I didn't graduate from college, actually. You, just to let you know. Yeah. So you, you're hired. While you're still at college. Yeah, I was uh, hired at uh, DD to be an intern, and I was an intern for one day. They gave me a test, and uh, it was on Scooby Doo 2. Uh, I built a harpoon. A harpoon right? yeah. yeah, I built a harpoon, yeah. textured it, rigged it, uh, was ready for animation. They they rendered it out. They sh- they looked at it on dailies, and they were like, you know what, we'll give you a full time job. It's great. Yeah, so it's pretty cool. It's kind of rare. I mean, usually yeah, you get a lot of people who like to go and do college, graduate, and right. they go to a bunch of extra courses, and they sit by the phone, and they're like, when they're going to call? Yeah, exactly. You know, so, uh, I think it's cool. I mean, yeah, especially if you get hired, like, while you're still in college. In school. I think that's the best way for students to actually try to get in the field, mm-hmm. because uh, once you're out of college, they already want to see what you accomplished mm-hmm. in college, so you might as well try to get an internship, or try to get a job while you're in college, because they're more willing to teach you, and let you fail a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, and guide you in the right way, then if you, you know, you graduate and you have a demo reel piece, they're, they're, they expect a lot more from you, you know? Yeah. It's a lot easier to be taught a pipeline once you're fresh than to already know a pipeline and not have it work and then re- reteach you in a new pipeline, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's really cool. I got, yeah, I worked on Scooby at um, Franny Films. So we did, like, the big end sequence. But, nice. yeah, I mean, that stuff was shit. That was cool. Um, and... What was it like coming from initially working at school where they're kind of like preparing you one way where it's like, okay, well, you're going to go into the workforce and you're going to work a very specific way, but um, was it actually what you expected? Like when you actually came in, where you're expecting um, it to be how it turned out, like in a very structured environment where everyone does like a little piece and right. it all comes together as one big image, you know what I mean? So yeah. uh, did it turn out that way? Was, that expected? was it that what you expected it had to actually be? I expected that. But um, they didn't really prepare you for that because, uh, you know, in graphic design or in schools generally, they give you like a little bit of everything and they teach you a little bit of everything and they want you to leave the school with a little bit of everything. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They don't, nobody really teaches you that, all right, to fit, to, for you to fit in a pipeline, you need to specialize in one area, mm-hmm. you know? And so for me, it was great because I got to touch a little bit of everything and then, um, got to decide and choose what I wanted to do mm. so it was, it was pretty cool but yeah definitely the pipeline was totally different I remember my first day sitting down and uh, Benoit telling me, us that all right you know that stuff you learn from school well, throw yeah, all, yeah throw all that shit out because um, mm. I'm gonna reteach you the right way you know and 
that, that's true. You know, so no school can probably teach you a proper pipeline. You know, mm. It needs experience. And that's why I always encourage uh, newbies to try to get an internship because uh, you'll learn so much more. I agree. I mean, I've been working, even I've been working for about five years like doing computer games and everything else, but um, working at home, all that kind of stuff. It wasn't until I actually worked at like a, a visual effects studio right. that um, I actually kind of, like the first two weeks, you learn so much from the people around you. And definitely. It's um, on, you know, on-site experience is definitely a lot more valuable than it's ever going to be to kind of, it's like, I guess anything, surgery or whatever, not the same category, but right. um, whatever you're going to learn in a book, you're not going to be able to walk out and be like, okay, I can apply this right away. You need to exactly. be hands-on. I think the pressure, too, is a very big deal, you know, having that deadline. Because at mm -hmm. school, they give you a deadline, but you don't make that deadline. It's usually just a drop grade. And people don't care that much about a drop grade in our industry because, you know, they don't look at your grade. No. It's all about your portfolio. So if you got a hard deadline and a boss watching you, that's going to make you learn how to work faster, how mm -hmm. to work smarter, how to manage your time. Like you said, you know, yesterday you were telling me about how you manage your time. It's outstanding, you know. Yeah, yeah. Really that another time, but yeah. <laughs> no, it's like, it's yeah, just from experience, you know, but it is good to experiment with work, better ways to work more efficiently. Um, right. Like one thing I learned just from managing other artists, I started managing myself with like having a spreadsheet of like all my shots, everything, and producers love you because they're used to doing that too. So suddenly right. you can give someone a spreadsheet and they're like, whoa, you're speaking my exact language, you know. Right, exactly. I work in, we're both working at Cypher right now, and uh, right. David, who's the, the super on the show, like, you know, he's pulling out a spreadsheet, I'm like, man, my, mine's got more colors than you do. You know, so. <laughs> um, but no, it's, it's very valuable. Um, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff is very important. Um, I do agree, though, like, you know, when you're starting a new job, I mean, you always have the pressure of when you're walking somewhere new, making sure you make that initial impression and everything else. Definitely. Um, I was working at Spy Post recently on uh, Priest, and like a colleague of mine, he came back after a few weeks to work a new commercial. And the first week, he's like, I'm going to quit 3D. This isn't for me. And he's just freaking out. I'm like, dude, like, yeah. everyone, including me, like, you know, the first time at a new place, sometimes you, you feel the pressure. And you're like, Definitely. Fuck, i got to make an impression. i got to do something. And right. So I told him, like, dude, give it a week and you'll be fine. And, you know, a week went by and he's like, oh, everything's better now. He's going to, like, leave the city. Like, he's completely freaked out that um yeah everybody freaks we all, out you we know? All do it to a degree you know? yeah i mean i listen to animation podcasts and that's a great uh mm -hmm. thing to get some resources off of but i mean i'm listening to glenn king you know like one of the best animators to date right mm -hmm. and he's talking about oh you know i'm just waiting for the day that disney comes through my door and says you're a fraud you know you are faking everything and he's like, you know what? But that wouldn't be that bad, you know? Because I can go spend some time with my family, learn a new career. Mm. You know, you just got to accept that fear and just work past it. Because, like you said, even you get scared. I I get terrified a lot, you know? But it's all yeah, it's I all mean, working past that. On Priest, uh, I went on. We, you know, my first week there, like, um, they wanted me to do all those dynamic simulations, like a motorbike. And the suit had been doing it a certain way. And I'm like, this isn't really working out. Um, in, a, in a real shot, this isn't working out right. And it's day three, and again, I'm not worried about what I'm doing, especially in like Max and Meyer, I'm pretty solid, but you still want to make that initial impression so everyone's like, okay, the pressure's off, he knows what he's doing, and you always just feel it subcon uh, subconsciously and subconsciously as well. But um, no, I just remember, like, screw it, I just took a day off, and like, I want to make some cool explosion for, for later in the shot, which you know, we need to do. Right. So na naturally everyone's like, holy crap, that's awesome. And then you're like, okay, now I can go back to what I was doing. And, exactly. You know, so then clients coming in the rest of the week, like, they're like, oh, we got to show you this explosion you did. So it's, you're like, okay, cool. Well, that's, that's out of the way. I mean, now, now I've done something, you don't feel the, the pressure. And like, okay, right. you can take a step back. You're back in your like, comfort zone, right? But again, like nine times out of 10, it's, it's 100% you. It's not anyone else who feels right. that. Right. Definitely. But, um, you know, it's, it's literally you being just very subconscious about yourself. But, it happens to everyone. I mean, I'm the first to always say, like, you know, walk in a new place and, like, holy crap, like, um, you know, you, you know, the first day, you're like, I haven't done anything yet. And, you know, then you, you right. do something, you're like, okay, everything's good. You know? Right, definitely. Yeah. At PSYOP, um, I was getting, like, you know, David would come up behind my shoulder and, like, oh, that's interesting. That's a good shot, you know. That's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm like, well, does that mean he likes it? Does interesting mean like he hates it? You know, because you, you mm -hmm. don't know. You're a brand new supervisor. You don't know his personality. Mm -hmm. You don't know what he's going to say. And then, you know, a week goes by. I'm like, well, I think they like my stuff. 
But then, you know, the producer comes by and she's like, you're making me look great. I'm like, well, damn, thank you, you know. Well, I think I am doing good for it then. Yeah. It's usually always you, you know. You're, you're your biggest uh, enemy, right? Mm. Yeah. I think I said to you yesterday, like, um, I was seeing someone yesterday that, you know, usually I get kind of used to, like, whenever I did my work, people kind of, look, you know, look at me like, wow, that's really cool. And I'd always be like, man, this looks terrible. Yeah, that's but right. the problem was that I get so comfortable with that that if I did something terrible, I'd be like, well, <laughs> I think everyone else is going to like it because I think it was a like crap. And they're like, dude, it looks like crap. <laughs> yeah, like, so it gives you mixed messages. Yeah, right? you're like, I don't I can't trust myself anymore. <laughs> but, um, no, it, it's, it's true. I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those things. And, I mean, that's also what I find really important. The more you repeat business with the studios, the more you kind of become familiar with what people like and also how they communicate. Right. So I was saying yesterday, like, certain people you might want to go to with a live action reference and lock down, okay, is this what you want or is this what you want? And you have that style sheet and then you can always refer back to it later when they say, oh, I wanted your smoke to be pink. You're like, well, no, it looks yellow here. This is what you approve. But either way, you can help them visualize and lock down the communication. Right. Um, Which is also useful because someone comes up and says, like, that was pretty. You can say, well, okay, that in his head means that's really good or it's not quite what I wanted. You know, I had one guy... 10 years ago I worked with and he'd always be like oh it looks interesting and to me yeah, he, didn't, he didn't realize it but like whenever he'd say that you know I'd call him on and say that means you don't like and he's like no one does it and I'm like no I've, I've known you for 3 years like interesting to you means a whole different thing and he's like well now you mention it like I was kind of imagining this so and again you, you get to learn the communication and right, after exactly. a while if you, if you look at things from more of a client point of view you can say look I think this is going to be really awesome but I know that he likes more kind of like subtle quick things and layers right. things up or whatever, uh, you begin to kind of think more of the end result rather than what you think is cool. So yeah, that's a huge, yeah. huge point, right? Um, thinking the end result. Looking at the bigger picture because uh, us as uh, effects artists and just as artists in general, we tend to stick on the minute things and, you know, little details and like, oh, this is going to be so cool. But then what if the camera doesn't even see that detail, right? Oh, or it's just yeah. shadow everywhere. It's like, well, that doesn't even matter. Just mm. look at the bigger picture. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, doing stuff like, uh, one thing I like, and I think you were doing it yesterday with your stuff, is like knocking out the entire result, kind of like an animatic. You block out all the bits and pieces. Right. And as long as people have the understanding that this is just a, a rough layout, then you can at least see the big picture. And you say, you know what? Like, we have this big explosion here with the foreground character here. You don't see anything in the background. It's so, like, all these comments you give me about this, that's kind of irrelevant at this point. Like, you're not going to notice it. Right. You know, and that's always, again, like, the, way, the main way I dodge the whole, like, someone finessing something too much is always like, right. look, let's put in bonus round. we got this bigger picture to look at, so we'll come back to this once everything else is done. Right. And people usually will be like, oh, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that later. And of course, you, most times you don't have time to get back to it later. But right. that's it. You're essentially that looking lines. out of the, the big picture instead of worrying about this one little thing. Um, Warhammer Dawn of War, we worked on that at Boy Studio, that was um, three and a half weeks to do from start to finish, and what I liked about that was we had like giant crowds of orcs and stuff like running over hills and goblins and stuff like that, and it was great because if you actually look at the animation, it looks kind of, like a lot of the background stuff looks terrible, like you'll have two keyframe animation like this, but, wow. but you don't notice it. Because yeah, I never you know, noticed that. And that's the thing, they kind of evaluate it, like, okay, we need to focus on the foreground and things you're right. going to notice, like where are your eyes going? And then, if we have time, we'll finish the stuff in the background. So, certain shots, it's terrible. They're literally just skating up the hill, but it, it worked out really well because yeah. your eye doesn't pick up on that. It's too exactly. busy looking at all the other visuals. The focus point, right? Exactly. Just focusing and on that. That's the, the most important thing, I think, is to look at the big picture and, okay, I'm going to do all the stuff, so like, why am I worrying about this one little thing? And yeah. I see that a lot, like, managing TDs, like, I'll, I'll get a guy who, I'm like, okay, we need you to make some sparks. And he'll come back two days later. I'm like, okay, you finished the sequence. He's like, no, I'm going to create this cool tool. And you hit sparks and you have a little button and you can adjust it. And then I'll create the sparks. And you're like, dude, it's one shot or whatever. Right, like, exactly. Like, we don't need any, like, you know, people just to be crazy to sparks. Yeah. Show off and do something that's really complicated when you don't need it to be. You know? Definitely. So, and you have to definitely uh, manage your time for other people too because – if they're telling you that, oh, we have six explosions, but then you realize that the explosions aren't the main focus point, mm. you, you have to dumb it down because then your explosion takes over the whole shot, and they're like, that's not what we wanted, you know? Mm. A lot of the times uh, I find myself 
putting a lot of details in, and then the details actually distract from the shot. So I have to pull it all back or put a big motion blur on it, you know what I mean? So, because it's distracting from the characters, you know, you don't want that. You want everything to be focused on the story, the, you know, what yeah, absolutely. generally it's going to go on in that shot. And um, just getting a bit back on track, because I want to try and keep it so much short, but um, with, with Blade, I mean, like, when we, like, I like the structure of how we did the film, because uh, Dee Dee was very structured in that sense. It was where, very good. But, I mean, it was kind of frustrating, too, as in, like, you essentially have a pipeline where people would uh, get a shot, you'd match move it, so you guys were doing a lot of match moving initially, and Definitely. then we'd bring it all in, we'd get the animation approved, and you get the, like, uh, effects animation maps all kind of approved as well. Right. Then from there it gets put out amongst like five artists to do all this stuff. So we had like um, Mitch Gates, Christian Zerker, Jason Crosby, myself, um, Fee. you, Fee, you know, yeah. other guys. And like, it's a pretty tight team of people. Right. And um, yeah, but at the same time, like, what I didn't like is the fact that essentially one shot would be split up to so many different people that right. each time you're literally jumping into a new thing. Whereas, you know, you could, again, I was always kind of stressing about the fact that you could automate all this, you know, and, but that was always the issue was like, you know, you could create the, the fire and the smoke, everything one time and then build the offset uh, parameters for it to then be able to like apply this effect to a vampire and then mm -hmm. from there offset everything to make it match, but we were essentially building everything from scratch the whole time Yeah. which um, was, it was interesting but it just meant that it was a lot slower because you'd have six people doing right. one vampire, Exactly. and we did 120 Plus vampires at the time, uh, so it got pretty intense. But I, th um, I think it was it was good for me, you know, because I was I was new in the industry, so I actually got to learn how you guys set up all the you know effects and stuff, mm -hmm. and it was really good to you know backwards engineer it, mm -hmm. and uh, it taught me a lot. I I, I know through like uh, management, it probably was like oh we sh we could do this a lot faster, and we could have definitely done a lot faster if we you know automated it, mm -hmm. but. Uh, as an uh, as an artist, a starting up artist, I appreciate it because it taught me so much more. Mm. You know what I mean? That's good. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it worked out well. I mean, I'm still a fan of that film just because, yeah, it, it was fun. To get, to get yeah, to it was a lot, a lot of, of fun. Do, like, again, like by the end of it, you, you've done so many vampires. It's just like, I think the quickest I did one shot was like eight minutes, I think, for the whole thing. But again, I was kind of using presets for a lot of stuff. Right, exactly. But, but I mean, it's good. I mean, with the work with a solid bunch of people like Fred Harrow. A lot of composers like uh, Leandro Visconti and Martin Sotel, yeah. I think, and a bunch of others. So, uh, yeah, it's cool. Like, I really enjoyed working there on that show. I still get calls from, you know, Blade Effects. Like, oh, we need vampires. And, well, I mean, mm. these days there's all vampires, werewolves. I think I've worked so. on six vampire shows so far. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, so, when they see embers, you know, like fire, they're like, oh, well, he's done Blade, you know, maybe he could do this effect for us, so, it's definitely worked out for me a lot. Can you give us the files? <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that, but yeah, um, yeah, that was, that was interesting, but, so you jumped, um, initially when you were studying 3D, were you studying Maya, or were you studying Max? I studied Max first, and then, uh, I helped implement Maya into my college, mm -hmm. because, uh, we were, you were looking at a lot, like, weren't you, uh, if I recall, again, this is a long time ago, but, right, yeah, yeah. I was helping them a lot, um, because we were trying to restructure the school and mm -hmm. trying to get students jobs. Because um, I was the only one that got into the film industry at the time from mm -hmm. my class, you know, out of 99 people. Yeah. You know, it, was, it was a huge class. But um, we, we tried to set up Maya because we looked at all the job uh, offers, you know, and mm -hmm. all of them were Maya, you know. And there was a couple of Max houses and stuff, but a lot of the Max houses I find don't really post them that much, you know? It's mm. usually word by, uh, you know, hiring by word, you know. Shows, word that's very interesting. Uh, one of the guys from Autodesk posted something about, you know, the future of Max, and um, someone complained that, you know, it would be great to see Max switch to, like, Unix and, like, Linux and a few other oh, systems right. because it'd be great to see it at Pixar and ILM and all these other studios, and I was just casually like, well, it is being used at, like, you know, digital domain, Pixar, ILM, and all these studios, and, you know, it's just, it doesn't get advertised. A lot of people don't know that, yeah. Yeah, but, like, you know, you get a lot of higher-ups in at Pixar, and, like, there, there's a lot of different areas, like, both, like, DJ Matt's and like that as well, but it's right. essentially, like, certain shots, like, um, there's a famous one that Neil Blevins got involved in uh, for The Incredibles, where they had testing out the rubber suit, and oh, the girl yeah. 
gets like, you know, the, the suit gets wound up really tight and I should turn my phone off. Um, but, you know, they're doing all this extreme stuff and they're using a lot of different packages and they couldn't quite get it and they use Max and it's just like right off the bat they're able to get, you know, Spina K and everything to work out really right. well. But ILM, Digimat, stuff like that, I did a, actually I posted a line, like I did a, like a one half hour talk a couple of times at ILM. Yeah, you know, discussing that was great. And stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting because a lot of places are doing that. I've had talks with a few really big, like some of the, the big five, you know, like R&H, DD, D- D- Pixar, ILM, and, you know, everywhere else, like, they, uh, I've spoken with a few who are actually looking at, well, we're bidding all these shows that all these other Mac studios are, like, underbidding us for, and, like, we can't compete because they're able to knock out, like, fire or, you know, something. Yeah, really fast. Yeah. yeah so, I think it's good that some studios actually are kind of, like, at least giving over the mind to, you know, what other tools are out there. I mean... Look at our work, you know. We're, we're a PSYOP right now, and uh, we're doing, you know, we're piping everything from Maya mm. into Max. You know, me and you are the only, oh, well, there's another Max artist there. But me and you, you know, we're, we're cranking out effects shots for, you know, Maya package. Mm. But we're doing it in 3D Studio Max because we can crank it out a lot faster. What's your experience? I mean, I'm, I'm, never, I'm never keen on, like, a Max versus Maya or anything like that. I'm a big fan of all of them, but it's always good to kind of see a bit of variation as to, like, what Definitely. tools have what strengths. Yeah, because I've also used XSI for three years in uh, Pandemic. Before. Oh, right. Yeah. I didn't know that. I used yeah, Soft we back in the SGI days, but I've yeah. used XSI. Yeah. It was, it, XSI actually has a re- some really cool tools for animation-wise, mm-hmm. and it's really fast. I think, you know, that might be one of the reasons Blur is using it for animation. Mm-hmm. But uh, a lot of the other stuff, you know, I would push towards Max or Maya, you know, because mm-hmm. they have... Like Max, Max is just so much better in effects, you know. Uh, yeah. And Ice might be changing things because I, they just implemented Ice into Ice is fast, which is what I liked about it. Like it's it's really flexible. Yeah, and it's and it's node based, you know. Mm. So it's it has a lot more flexibility. Well, that was my big frustration. I like I started out in three studio DOS. Well, I started earlier than that, but like <laughs> no, you know, like Popper and all that kind yeah. of crap. But like you started in that, we had like I pass routines, you can create fire take about three hours of frame to render, but you could do some basic stuff in there, but um, it wasn't until Max, like, I started getting into effects, started doing all this stuff, but the interesting thing was Maya had like per particle based scripted particles, you do a lot with it, right. so I love that, I completely was sold, I switched to Maya for a good couple of years, and then wow. Particle Flow came out for Max, Thinking Particles came out for Max, yeah. Afterburn, like I was working in a lot of Maya studios where like, okay, we need clouds, we need explosions, whatever. I'd jump with, like, an old, like, 3D Studio Max 3 or something and knock out the effects in Max because until 2003, uh, Maya couldn't really do good very much of stuff. They had, like, digital na- nature tools from Rite. Yeah. Uh, that was, like, you know, 99, 2000, and that was terrible. There wasn't any good, solid kind of ways to build clouds or anything. Right. So, um, eventually, Maya Fluids came out, and you can do good stuff, but it's kind of clunky, but slower. Slow, and, yeah. But yeah, Houdini was still very solid, but the interface was a bit alien to some people, but Houdini 9 changed all that as well. Right. XSI was... Uh, Softimage had really amazing particles back in the day, but they were like a separate EXE, they weren't even in the same package. Right. And then XSI came out, XSI was a flop. But then XSI 3 started to ramp up, get better. When Ice came out, they are no base as well. Right. So the end particles come out, you're like, okay, this is the big thing here we go, and it's like, oh wait, no, you're just like an additional solver for Right, for that, I, I was hoping for it, you know what I mean? Because when I played with it, I was like, oh yes, you know, mm. time to get back into Maya. Because uh, I usually use Maya for animation, rigging, you know, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I wanted to get back into Maya's particles, but you know, it, it just seemed like it was the same thing, a little bit updated, you know, you get shake, a... Not, not shake collisions, more... Radius-based collision stuff like that. Right. Was, yeah. You still you're still not getting the 100% collision effects that you want, mm-hmm. but I mean it still takes a really really long time to get results too. Mm-hmm. So yeah. But other areas of Maya are great. It's just like effects oh, yeah. to me has always been a bit of a frustration. Right. But um, yeah, I mean it's just interesting. Again, like I've I always get the the thing like you know what what's your favorite package? I'm like I hate them all. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> they all have its problems. You know, yeah. they all have its flaws. They all have their strengths. So. Mm-hmm. It's definitely taking, if, if you know a lot more packages, you, you can work a lot faster because you know, okay, I'm going to do my effects in Max, I'm going to do my animations in Maya, you know, and maybe I'll 
do some compositing or rendering in XSI. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Especially with like uh, tools like Oven Oven Point, I believe it is. It, that fakes out right. birds. You know, you could bring it to any package you want. FBX have had issues with. I mean, most people have found the pipeline they usually use is export OBJs and then you export point caches and use a right. tool to convert between the two and that's like 100% solid. I've been getting pretty good results in the new FBX exporter. At least one from Maya. Yeah. Solid. And uh, I'm, I'm getting like, I'm getting uh, rigs, I'm getting deformation, I'm getting like really, really good results from Maya to Max. Mm -hmm. It's just that it gets super heavy because if you hide geometry in Maya and then you want to export all that in FBX, it brings everything in and it'll bring it hidden but like it, it's it's a see through you know kind of thing, right. and it's just it just boggles down the computer you know what I mean. And I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna add effects onto that you know really big file. So might as well start off with really small file before that's right, that's start right. tagging on that you know. So at the point of leaving DD, like you kept working film for a while, or did you? Uh, after I left DD, I went to broadcast. I went to like History Channel and Discovery. So we were working at a place called Red Gypsy. So we were doing a lot of that stuff and a little bit of commercials, but not, you know, mostly for History Channel. Mm -hmm. And you eventually go into games, right? So you started yeah, switching with XSI, you're doing effects and stuff like that. I was, I, I was trained on effects, but then they brought in a specialist because he had to script a lot of his tools. Mm -hmm. And so we, because of our engine, they had to rewrite their whole tools and stuff for the effects. So I was a, a character animator at... Mm. the game company. So I animated uh, in-game animations and I did uh, cinematic animations. And I was uh, the only artist that I know of in Pandemic that was using Face Robot. So I was in charge of the pipeline from the mocap to bringing it onto the rig, getting it on the rig and bringing it into the game engine and making it look correctly. So you had a lot of experience with Face Robot? So I, I've had like Two years of face robot experience. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it? it's yeah. not a bad tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I also say an amazing rig artist can do the same thing that face robot does. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it's good. No, I mean, it's good. I mean, I've known you for so long, but again, yeah. usually when we catch up, I don't really want to talk about. Yeah, we're not talking about three D. We're yeah. drinking, having fun, <laughs> going to Vegas. There we go. <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, so it's good. I, I didn't know about they actually use face robot. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. And um, how would you find? Using that, like, Face Robot was interesting. Um, now, I don't know because we had limitations, and I don't know if the limitations were because of Face Robot or if it was our game engine. I would say I would put my money on it was mostly the game engine. Mm. So, we were using uh, bone rigs for the Face Robot, and uh, where we would have preferred to use a little bit more blend shaping, but blend shapes weren't uh, working with our game engine, so we had to take, take that out of the you know, puzzle. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah, so I had to retweak everything to make it work with the bones structure. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the game, the game I'm talking about is Saboteur. It's from EA. It's a black and white uh, World War II game. Mm -hmm. War II, yeah, World War II game. So, um, but we would get uh, funny results with uh, the smiles, you know, the, this little the area with, with yeah, the and stuff. this was the biggest problem with our, with our animation. So, I find that when I was tweaking uh, my animations for the face, it was uh, mostly over-exaggerating it because mm -hmm. the game engine would dub it down, you know. So mm -hmm. giving it 50% more wouldn't look like 100% what I was seeing on screen. Mm -hmm. So you have to tweak. It was really like the first week was just playing around. What What is the engine going to see and what is my monitor showing me and trying to match, you know, mirror each other. That's right. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I mean, like, my experience with games, I mean, mainly just Team Fortress 2 and Prototype. But, um, like, Prototype was interesting because, again, the challenge isn't really about, like, what visually you can do. It's more about what you can do within the constraints of the game engine. Definitely. And um, there's always, like, okay, well, we can't do any of these features that you used to. There's a lot of limitations. There's always challenges, and that's right. why I kind of found what was interesting was kind of working around that. Um, they had, like, vertex animation they could do, but... Again, a lot of people kind of look at me and go, oh, you come from film, right. don't bring all this film stuff with you. It's like, exactly. no, well, I do come from film, and that's why I was coming in to help that company Radical, because um, I would be able to bring a lot of the approaches to how we did things into the game. Right. So, you know, I think that was one show like, in the cinematic that we were doing that. 
there's like a wall, it's like all veiny, crumbled vines like all on it, and right. this girl, like the lead kind of evil boss girl on it, she just puts her hand near the wall and the wall kind of crumbles and breaks, and mm. I said it would be amazing to actually see all the vines like snapping as like the, the brick wall crumbles, and oh, that's cool. the whole vine breaks and does all the stuff. Naturally, everyone's like, you can't do it. Like, that's just unheard of, like, cloth simulations and all breaking. And, right. But I'm like, no, we can do it. Like, so what I ended up doing is I essentially modeled the basic geometry of this viney thing Vines. on the wall, cut it all up, and then reattached it all through kind of vertex bindings where, based on the tension, they would snap. Mm-hmm. And then so you have, like, a low poly, like, 50, 60 poly uh, mesh for the vines. But then I'm able to run the simulation and bake... The vert- the yeah, exactly. Right. So nice. what you get is the wall would crumble, and these vines would actually move with it as one mesh. Whereas when one brick would fall, it would tear that bit away, and it would crumble, and like the you know stuff would flop. And it, awesome. it was stuff that you wouldn't usually see in games. But again, like you're looking at ways you can do all this stuff that you're used to doing within the constraints of the technology you're using. Right. And I thought that was just interesting, looking at the problem solving aspect of it. But um, I mean, you can do so much with games. It's just Right. How the hell are you going to work around the limitations? Yeah, exactly. Just mm-hmm. work around. So, I mean, we do cheats all the time with film, right? Cause oh, yeah. Like at the we, end of the we day. We have a lot more freedom in film. Exactly. At the end of the day, it's all 2D. <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. right? If you, if you can Photoshop frame by frame, shit, dude, you, you, can, you can do the effects there. Yeah. But <laughs> it's all going to be 2D at the end. So, you know, like a lot of people worry about, oh, my God, what am I going to see through this side or mm-hmm. this side? I mean, with films, shoot, you just animate to the camera, you know? That's with, right. With games, yeah, you kind of have to worry about, oh, what if the character walked around this area? Or, you get to you know, see it from every angle. Yeah. Exactly, right. And how do you find the comparison between games and film and broadcast? Like, um, I would say that film has a lot more freedom, you know? Because at the end of the day, it's all 2D, right? Um, but... Games is a lot more challenging, like you said. We have to work around the limitations, trying to figure out. It's a lot of problem solving a little bit more. Mm. So um, I, I find that challenging. Broadcast is different because the challenge is in the deadline. The deadline yeah. yeah, exactly. It's like how fast can you do this and how fast can you make it look good? You know? That's so a secondary thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, that's part two. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah that's, that's there's a lot right. of limitations. But And also, um, I've done previews for a lot of movies too. And that's the same thing too. Um, it's like, I want to animate all this stuff with secondary motion and overlap and, you know, make it really, yeah, really beautiful, yeah. but it, all, at the end of the day, they just need a placement with a character, as you can slide them literally, mm-hmm. but it's the camera that really matters, you know, and after, you know, a month of it, I realized, okay, I should be tweaking the curves on the camera a lot more and paying attention to my camera animation than my character animation, mm-hmm. you know, that's the number one thing they want you to knock out because that's what's going to save them money mm-hmm. you know that's what essentially that's what previous is yeah it's it's a money saver right for all those film industry no I, absolutely i mean um, I've, I've seen it abused a little bit but right uh you know I, I've, I've we all have now because i've, I've seen a few movies where bigger. like i've worked with certain directors on certain superhero movies where they're um, <laughs> that, that um yeah that they'll literally have previous dialogue and stuff like that to the point where well, you know, should I have the camera over your shoulder yeah. or up here? I and think that you can leave to a storyboard artist. Well, you know? usually you, you want to hope that there is enough visualization going on that they, they envision how this is going to be. And it's more, I, I guess now that you can, they go a lot more in-depth with like creating a whole anime for an entire film. But right. before it was always kind of like, how the hell are we going to do this expensive shot? So that way you know you're going to do it right. And, right. and you're not going to waste any time or money for long of a miniature you spent three months and usually it's action, you know, yeah, really yeah. action. And you action. need to make sure you have it all right, you got to hit the right beats, you got to right. get the right angles. So, um, yeah, but now, like, suddenly it's like, okay, well, you know, the love scene, we're going to see what angle we can get that, you know, works best for it. And yeah. But then it's post viz which is actually now the big thing, too, where right, once they film everything, good. then they want to start blocking it all out and, uh, right. you know, really kind of solidifying a lot of the, the action and everything else, too. Right. So, yeah, I've seen, like, complete sets being redone. Where actually Scooby was probably the first one I ever witnessed that happen. Where um, there's like a big sequence where I think Scooby's got a fire extinguisher and he's freezing stuff and like kind of skating on the ice as he's freezing it. And oh yeah, this crazy stuff. The entire fire, fire. environment fire. was um, was uh, uh, completely 3D, like uh, Frank Films and Prime Focus. They replaced the entire environment because 
they wanted more freedom with the camera. Right. So the director's like, oh, I wanted the camera to do this. It's like, well, you already filmed it, so you can't really do that. And they're like, well, I want to do it. Then so you have to refilm it, right? Well, you Re-shoot can't, because you can't really reshoot it. So instead, what they would do is they would actually replace the backgrounds and essentially make oh. the entire environment digital. Right. And that's like expensive, but it, it is possible to do. And that means you have complete freedom to move the camera where if you want to do. Right. So HDRI definitely helps a lot more with that. Now you can get a complete panoramic. That's a lot of roto aims. <laughs> yeah, well, if, if that's what they want to do, it's, essentially it's going to be cheaper than reshooting. Definitely. Essentially, when you have contracts with a lot of talent who like, no, you've had me for this the time. The actors, right. Yeah, any reshoots are going to be like a million dollars a pop. Yeah. Know, so especially they, with uh, actors, the actors go, right? They get a lot of money, exactly. especially if they're just waiting around oh, trying yeah. to set up. Yeah. Exactly. So suddenly doing it digital is more practical. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's just it's ridiculous. Like, I think the first time I ever saw something that kind of made me sick to my stomach was Phantom Menace, like when George Lucas was literally looking at cuts and saying, I don't like his performance and I like this takes performance of this guy and like literally splicing actors together. It's just like, is this what it's going to be? Like, you know, his yeah. finger was twitching, we'll fix that and we'll get him as a uh, shooter. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's, he's got a watch on. Well, I've seen some like ridiculous calls where it's like I can't believe you're you're doing this in CG. Yeah. But um, so that's kind of interesting. Like looking at you know like what else interesting in as guess is like previs and like with your animation because you do a lot of animation, you do a lot of previs, and you do a lot of effects. So um, do you think that having a better understanding about animation timing and waiting and stuff like that? you can apply that to the effects that you, you do, like with dynamics and... Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, because you learn about those beats and those important beats and yeah. uh, which ones to hit and when to hit them. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the times, uh, it's all about timing, right? <laughs> Even in life, you know, it's all about timing. So it, it does help me set up things and having pre in my background helped me so much more because I have to now pre all my shots now that's how it works, you know. It's just natural now. Previs all my shots, get it in front of somebody, have them rip it apart. This way, I know what to work on. And if he didn't say anything about that one, shoot, that that shot's final. You know what I mean? Great. Right. Just keep working on the ones that are important and, and people it. exactly, and add more detail, get it finalized, see where the lighting's going to go, see where the character's going to stand, because all those things can really, really affect your effects, mm. right? Like if it's standing in front of my explosion, well then I can run a lower sim, you know, it would be way faster. Mm-hmm. I can put my attention into something else. Mm-hmm. So it definitely has um, pushed me forward. You know? What about now, like, a couple of things you've been, like, obviously, now you're going to get more into commercials at the moment. You're working at, like, Pixel Mondo on Nightmare on Elm Street. You're doing other couple of films. Do you work on Airbender? I yeah, know. I worked on Airbender. Yeah, so your last Airbender just came out as well. Right. A couple of the really big films. Um, so... Obviously, you're doing a lot of freelance, especially around LA, and especially effects, animation, a lot of stuff like that. But in the meantime, you've also been working like a lot of your own IP and getting right. other things like that going on. Like, so you have Crazy Eight, which uh, Crazy Eight, which is kind of like your big thing at the moment. Yeah. Um, I, I feel guilty because I know a lot of I, I know a lot about what you've been doing with it, but I don't know like the huge background behind it or anything else oh, okay. with it as well. So, but more importantly, like you, what have you been doing with that? Like, where is it? come from and where is it going? Crazy It started when um, I worked with this concept artist named Jeremy Milton mm-hmm. at Pandemic and uh, I saw his concept art and he was posting posting them on his blog and I was like wow there is so much character in his drawings you know we ha- and, and it's a unique style too mm-hmm. you've seen it it's really painty oh, you know a lot of paint strokes and stuff like that and I was wondering how Actually, can we get that? Sorry, you guys to stand up and yeah. pimp it out. This is, is this is our uh, clothing line. It's called Motor Billy Boogie because we have a separate uh, entity for the clothing line. But Crazy Eights essentially owns uh, Motor Billy Boogie. So we a character. Or we or kept we kept it separate. Well, with the character in the middle right here, the Tiki character, we have um, we have a Tiki planet that the Crazy Eights visits. So. It's, we have so many different themes that what our main logo is going to be the checker flags mm-hmm. and uh, the stuff in the middle where the tiki guy's standing it Change. will be changed out mm-hmm. you know and with the girl line we have you know the sexy girl slaps um, sitting in the middle you know so mm-hmm. we're, we're going to change it up um, a lot so you'll see a lot of different characters in between 
you know, Motor Billy Boogie. Cool. But uh, we started together because, you know, I saw his artwork and I was just like, we have to do something with it. So what we did, um, we entered a competition called Red Stick in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, 248 entries, you know, so many different countries. And uh, we were the top f- 15. Oh, yeah. So we were brought to Louisiana and to pitch in front of Disney, Nickelodeon, MTV, and Gotham Group. Gotham Group is the people that do the D, uh, DC comics, uh, straight to DVD. So um, we went there, competed uh, for I think it was about two to three days, and um, you know they would top fifteen. They would talk. To, uh, they give you a four-hour class, tell you what we want to see, what we don't want to see in pitches and stuff. So we took that class. We. So they actually gave you a class on like how to pitch to them. Yeah, it was pretty cool. cool. It was really cool. You take a lot of knowledge away from that as well, just definitely later. Yeah, they're like, don't come into the pitch and telling us, oh, this we can sell products with this. We can sell hats, shirts, and all that stuff. I wouldn't mind doing that. Yeah, no, it's a lot. It's it's a lot of information. Really, really good class. And so we came out of there. We rewrote the whole story in one night. You know, me and my buddies stood up all night and just rewrote it in in a little hotel called uh, Super Eight. Funny enough. I keep thinking of calling it Super 8 when you say Crazy 8, because there's also Super 78, which is uh, right. the studio of Hollywood. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I keep going, how's Crazy 8? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, stuttering. But then, uh, you know, we, we wrote it, we uh, made the judge ha- happy, and we got up to the t- uh, final five. And so, wow. that last day, we got to stand on, on a podium, uh, pitch it to everybody. Anybody and everybody that wanted to sit in there. So, you know, Nickelodeon and all those people were really, like, awesome. they were the panel that we had to uh, And this, this stuff happening right now, obviously getting clothing line, like, there's a lot of interest in that. Right, we got, we got our first clothing line last last week, and uh, we are starting to, you know, sell them and uh, get the name known. But uh, right now, the clothing line is only meant to support the animation, because we're still yeah. trying to find funding for animation. And the TV show, it's it's a 13 episode series, mm-hmm. you know, and we're doing the pilot right now as we speak. So we have a lot of um, really talented artists working for us, and they're they're doing it because of the passion of the project. You know, they're they're donating their time. They're it's donating industry people too, right? Yeah, a lot of industry people. We don't have we don't have any you know any interns or straight from college because we want quality. You know, if we do, I mean, not to say that, you know, kids coming out of college isn't creating quality. If we do, we will definitely, um, you know, really, really yeah. pick the, the top of the, the top of the classes and stuff. Cool. Yeah. cool. It's been a really fun adventure, but we're trying to get this show started as soon as possible. Our goal was by the end of this year. So it's starting to look towards the end of this year, uh, a little bit beginning of next year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. That's yeah. awesome. It's really fun. Um, the background behind it is it takes place in the 50s, mm-hmm. so it's a very retro look, but it's it's what happens after War of the Worlds, you know? Like, if that happened, we vanquished all the aliens, now what happens, you know? We have this alien technology on Earth, you know, people, uh, teenagers are stealing it, modding it in their hot rods, <laughs> and flying out in the outer space, you know? And they have, like, places, like, where we uh, project movies on the moon, you know, all these hot rods are floating there watching movies projected on the moon. Driving. Yeah, exactly. So we have a lot of, a lot of ideas like that, and hopefully they'll all stick, but a lot of them right now are, you know, going through the process of, you know, is that a good idea, does that help the story, is that character driven, you know, really important things, because our most important thing is that it's character based, and it's a really good story, you know, without those two fundamentals, I don't think we can uh, have a series. Mm. You know, a lot of people are just like, that's really cool. Let's see it animated. Let's see it, you know, moving. And that's that's not the idea behind this. You no, know what I mean, it's tell a story to have people watch it, remember their childhood, you know, have fun, you know, bring you back. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's why we're having a lot of fun with it. Because if we can't have fun with it, nobody's gonna watch it. Mm. That's one thing I like about the U.S. It always has like the Mel's Diner and all that. Yeah. <laughs> more like 50s, 60s kind of feel to it. Definitely. Bob Big Boys. You know yeah, that? Big Boy, yeah. <laughs> Freaking Boy Bank, yeah. Yeah, after parties. <laughs> um, actually, I was reading a cheat sheet on like, character development um, yesterday or the day before about like, you know, how to, like, what goes into creating character, like um, ways to give the character a lot of depth and history and background and stuff right. like, you know, 
where he gets heartbroken or, you know, what's his favorite thing and what's his pet's name. Yeah. And just like, but again, like the stuff that you wouldn't even think about and like creating this whole universe. And like, there's certain people out there who've like gone and like built this whole universe just to kind of give authenticity to the character. And, right. And then people will kind of find out more about the background of like, this whole world of creative and be like, well, that in its way is like a whole freaking movie. But right. you know, essentially he's doing it to get more of an authentic feel to the, the characters you develop. Yeah. So, why, why does Star Trek create like their own language? Because they want an authentic yeah. feel, right? Yeah. They want you to feel like that's actually going to happen in the future, or that's, that's already people from getting played. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway, I split Star Trek. Um, like there's a hotel or a bar, I think. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's like a nightclub. Yeah, I haven't seen I heard that, that years ago before I even visited the US. Like, um, someone was telling me you go to Vegas, it's free alcohol. I'm like, I'm sold. <laughs> But yeah, they're like yeah, you go to Star Trek place and these like ridiculous. Did I bring you th for the first time? Yeah, two thousand four. That's right. right. Or, uh, or during Blade. Yeah, because I remember you holding your glass out. And you're like, look, alcohol in the middle of the street. Take yeah. a picture. I got photos of that and placed that on Vegas phone. <laughs> but um, yeah, the second time I went was Superman Returns. We had the rap party, so Warner Brothers took all of us out. Uh, we got I got on the bus and like cocktails. Eleven That's awesome. awesome. Drove all the way here. Yeah, it was good. Like um. It's good after we, we killed ourselves in the movie, so yeah, that's gonna good to do that. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been interesting. I love Vegas, it's like my third time, so that's right. Yeah, but I, I kind of figured, yeah, we, we shoot it outside, it's gonna be too many drunken people. Yeah, woo! <laughs> right, <laughs> but, uh, walking by, ah, hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's your favorite project? Like, wh like what have you worked I, I know I've got, I, I always find this to be a good question, even for myself, when I do interviews, this is always like. What is your favorite project? Because you'll find ones that were fun, that were challenging, or just something about it that kind of like really, you know, like made you think that went well. That really was like a solid piece to work on. So, like, yeah. uh, what was your favorite project so far to work on? Uh, Blade was. Duke, Blade, Duke. Yeah, Blade is uh, actually up there, all, you know, on the top, top two. But um, I would say uh, working for Pandemic working for a video game company mm -hmm. it, it gave me stability but not only that it made me see the limitations in a game and also how how to work in um, a big studio you know that was the, one of the biggest studios I've worked for you know pandemic and then they got bought out by EA and then we were this huge entity you know what I mean mm -hmm. but then they shut us down so <laughs> uh, it's, yeah yeah it's um, it's interesting to see the politics behind definitely games you know and right but I mean, yeah, it's kind of like the evolution of it. Like, the, essentially, it's all about money at this point. And, you know, if you can't make like, a AAA game that is going to make uh, 150 mil profit right off the bat, then it's, right. it's going to be, um, you know, a bit of a, a bit a of a risk. Gamble, you know? yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but I, I, I think that project was fun for me, especially because. Um, I met a lot of really talented artists there. Mm -hmm. I still keep in contact with them. You know, a lot of them are working on Crazy Eights. With great, me. great. So, you know, that's why I think um, Blade was so fun too, because a lot of us still keep in contact. You know, we still work with each other. We still, you know, yeah, talk to each other and party with each other. But I think that's what you bring out of uh, a lot of the studios. It's not. It's not the. I hate to say this, but it's not the project. It's the people that you meet, the experience that you get from the people that you meet, you know, and the and the and the growth, man. You just grow. Every studio that I've gone to, I have grown a lot. I think, yeah, we are in an industry where it is pretty. Like we're pretty lucky to be in this industry where we get to travel, we get to work on big projects, we get a lot of freedom, and creativity to do whatever we want to do. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I love it. I mean, it gives me a chance to kind of see the world and. Definitely. Make a bit of money and you know, work on cool yeah. stuff too. So yeah, you're working on cool stuff. Somebody's paying you, and you get to have fun. You know, yeah, most you can't ask for. It. Yeah, you can't ask for anything. Horses and stuff in between. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it all depends on how you put yourself into it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're gonna sacrifice all that stuff, then you know, that's up to you. But a lot of people, you know, have fun. They know, they know the coworkers. You know, mm -hmm. I bring in, I brought in you. You know, thank God you came in. <laughs> no, but Justin brought me in, you know, and it's uh, vice versa. You know, you bring in your friends that can back up their work. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Nobody's going to nobody's gonna invite their friend that can't back up their work because it's just going to make them look bad. Yeah. But, yeah, that's why, we, that's why we all stay together. Initially, when I started working with you, it was 2004, so it was about six years ago. You had just going out of college, and we talked about this already, but 
you just go down to college and um, go and right into working visual effects. Like you know, you're literally pulled out and go right into doing visual effects for uh, Blade Trinity as well as Scooby Doo. That's right. And um, like, what was your experience with that coming from um, being in college and then jumping right into production and like how prepared were you for all of that? I would say uh, DD prepared me by throwing all my knowledge away from college and t t reteaching me a pipeline. Mm. And teaching me a pipeline that actually works with, you know, a group of people, compositors, you know, rig artists, TDs, everybody. So it was really, really refreshing because uh, I don't think school can really prepare you for that. They say they can, but, you know, you have to be working to really get that feel and get that knowledge. Mm. Yeah, experience is more than anything. So getting yeah. internship and all that stuff is very, very important for people right out of college or in college. That's right. And, um, yeah, I mean, as much as colleges are a good way to kind of get a better understanding of the basics, right. I don't want to talk bad about a lot of people who come from, col I come from speaking in college, but the downside is that at least um, when you're wanting to hire industry people, you can't really afford someone who is charging like six figure salary to come and speak at your college and take their like 15, 20 years experience with Definitely. them. So they need to kind of usually get someone who's a bit more affordable and usually kind of is on their way out of the industry. And that's kind of a more broad generalization, but um, it is usually you can't necessarily grab people who are our day to day working industry and um, kind of keeping up to date with all the stuff going on. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a kind of a balance, you know, like, as much as you can prepare for it, you know, you're not necessarily going to be able to let people know what it's like, that's so how you're really going get, to get in there and start doing it. And I'm not bad-mouthing colleges, because uh, college is really important, you know, I met my mentor there, and mm -hmm. Ruben Apodaca, and he taught me a lot, you know, he taught me stuff that, you know, working couldn't teach me, with life experiences, you know, but he was a retired uh, 2D animator mm -hmm. that worked with uh, the nine old men from Disney. So he had a lot of experience, and like you said, he was on that way out. You know, he just wanted to teach. He wanted to spread his knowledge, and uh, let the younger generation take over. That's great. Yeah. You mentioned it before, like, um, what were some of the like kind of bigger influences that he had taught you? Like, what have you taken away from your experience with him? He taught me. He nailed me to the wall with principles. Mm -hmm. Learning the principles, knowing it in and out, backwards, you know, whatever. And because if you don't know the principles, you can't do, you know, the advanced yeah. stuff. So you always fall back onto your principles. So he definitely nailed that into my head. That's good. Um, yeah, I think it's good general knowledge. I mean, a lot of people kind of skip that and kind of get more into well, all the technical stuff. That's what I need to know. And then I really follow up on the fact that, okay, well, we need to work like about anticipation and timing and right. weight distribution and, like, getting the, the real feel to your, your work. And if it doesn't have character, That's then, you know, kind of can fall apart, you know, it's just, right. yeah, I see a lot of explosions and stuff like that, where it's just like, yeah, right, you know, it's, it's just an explosion. You mentioned me once that, um, I think it's like your first day of college, you went in, and was, was it him or someone else who kind of like looked around the room, right, like, how did that go? Ruben, Ruben uh, would come in the first day, and uh, he would give the 10% speech, he'd be like, alright, 10% of you guys are gonna graduate and get a job in the career and th that you want. And then 5% uh, out of the 10% will make it and make it really good for themselves. Now, one person out of that whole percentage will make it big and create his own style, his own, you know, characters, his own stories, will make it really big and make a name for himself. And he would go, he would point around the room, like, who's that, who's that one person? And there was me sitting in the back, like, all right, I guess it's me. <laughs> He's like, oh, that person already passed. He has confidence in himself. That's good. So, it was it was it was great with Ruben because he also realized that not a lot of people there were really wanting to learn from him. Mm. So he said, you know, as long as you pay your tuition and my car payments are taken care of, then you guys can take a pillow in the back and you know go to sleep. But the people that want to learn, you come sit up front and I'll teach you everything I know. Mm. And that's what every student should take out of it, you know. Yeah, is that I'm paying for this, I should get as much as possible. I mean, I remember shadowing that guy, just bugging him. How do you like this drawing? How do you like this drawing? And then he would literally take my portfolio and draw right on top of it. And I'm sitting there like, 
<laughs> oh my God, that took me like two days to draw, you know, and he, he let me know that you should not fall in love with any piece of artwork because it should be changed mm. to the perception of who's looking at it, you know. That's right. No, that's good advice. Um, yeah, actually, like I, I did a year of like lecturing university when I was younger and it was interesting for me because you get a mixture of people. This was for like multimedia game development. We had the first game development course and, um, it was just interesting because you would get varied age groups. And one thing I liked is I was 17, I think, at the time, turning 18. And I, I, I thought it was great that I had some, like, 45-year-old people who had no problem, like, taking advice from me, whereas I expected them to be like, well, who the hell are you? you know? right. but, but, I mean, what was interesting to me was the fact that you get a lot of the older people coming in and you get all the younger people. And you could tell who came straight from high school because they are the ones who kind of, like, expected – you to, it's your responsibility to teach them, right. and um, all the <clears throat> more experienced people, like 25 or older, they're the ones who are like, I've paid money, I'm coming here to learn, and like, I want to soak up this knowledge and do the best I can, That's right. and all the younger people were kind of like, no, you teach me, and it'd be like, no, well, your parents are whoever paid for it, and it's not my responsibility, you've got to pay attention and do your thing, otherwise, like, I'm not going to like give you detention and <laughs> make you uh, like force this down your throat, it's exactly. your responsibility to learn. And, um, yeah, the people who really did, you know, pay attention and, and have that, you know, yearning to, to learn, they're the ones who fast track, it is 10 years, 10 years ago, um, yeah, they're the ones who were all working on all the big studios in Australia and US, um, yeah, they've all done really well for themselves and right. all the other guys are kind of like, yeah, that didn't really work out for me, I'm going to try ballet. Yeah. <laughs> you can't yeah. teach somebody passion, right? Yeah, that's something exactly. you just have to have. Mm. Yeah, that's so, I, yeah, I agree. I, mean, I think it's one of the biggest things you need is the passion to learn and also have clear goals. And I mean, did you have any specific goals? Like, I, I'm just going to make a realization recently about a lot of my kind of goals and where I'm at now with a lot of them. And um, I, I do think it's kind of crucial to drive yourself, you know, through that. And um, I mean, with you, like, do you have any? Did you have any goals back then as to where you wanted to be? Yeah. You know, six, five, ten years. Definitely. Later. Yeah, I remember my first goal um, going into DD. I was like, all right, my first goal is to see my name on the screen. You know, mm -hmm. that was so important to me. But nowadays, like, my goals are totally different. You know, just making the client happy, <laughs> getting the job done as fast as I can. You yeah. Know? Well, you've got a family and that kind of like switches priorities a bit. It's definitely. Well, but, yeah, yeah, definitely. Hey, everyone, we're back. Um, Unfortunately, when we were shooting this in Vegas, I didn't consider the fact that we didn't have any battery uh, left on the camera. So, suddenly we're in Santa Monica, uh, <laughs> place, so uh, see the beautiful beach. Yep. Uh, which is actually good because every morning I've woken up so far, it's been fog. And I walked to work the other day and literally it was fog all the way out to like Abikini. So, um, yeah, it's actually not bad. It's crazy that you can see the fog in my I drove into it. Well, I was going to San Francisco. Um, yeah, San Fran is like, if you're coming from Marin County and you're going over the bridge, you literally see this giant, like, cloud of fog. It looks like uh, Independence Day, a big cloud tank and uh, stuff, and you wait for a big UFO to roll out of this thing. It's just this concentrated area. What I figured we'd do is quickly talk about a couple of things just to wrap up. So, I think, backtracking to Vegas, um, you were saying Return Ballet like, was your favorite project to work on. Yeah, my favorite project to work on. Yeah, it's probably uh, DD and DD. Uh, see, I've got a good memory, and I know that you said that was your second favorite project. Oh so, shit! What was my first? Then? I don't know. You're about to. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Blade was Blade was awesome because I you know I got to meet a lot of talented people, and it was one of my first projects to see what uh, a true pipeline was, and to have technical directors and people to support you and actually like a whole crew that knew what they were doing. Mm. It just, it was just a, every day was a learning experience. So I, I, I got a lot out of Blade and also the demo one piece, and I still get calls for it mm -hmm. to this day, you know? So that was really fun, you know? I got to meet you. <laughs> Crazy. Well, um, no, it's interesting. I mean, looking back on Blade, I mean, in a way, it was a pretty solid pipeline in terms of things were consistently being passed around and 
for the most part, the interaction and everything. Um, in terms of how many people were doing the same mundane tasks over and over and over, personally, I think that it, it was a little convoluted and didn't need to be as structured as, structured as it was. Um, Benoit, I think, likes to kind of set things up that way. And, you know, you know I, I personally think a lot of it could have been automated. A lot of it could have been done with less people and a lot of a tighter team. I, essentially, people could have been utilized a bit more efficiently than it was. But um, it definitely was a pipeline. Right, you know, exactly. You know, one way or another. So I, so. I've, seen, I've seen worse, so Actually, I that, appreciate it so much. That, that's one thing, because um, I guess we've been having a few discussions lately. Um, and that's something interesting to, to talk about is like where, and this I guess is a big debate where they come from feature films, the commercials, games, and uh, all things in between. I mean, we've both been talking to Selwick recently and yeah. um, he's gained insight into how quickly they're turning stuff out. Um, you know, obviously in that situation, you're not going to do like a, a Blade 3 pipeline because exactly. that kind of thing is essentially. Um, a lot tighter turnarounds, and that's the thing is you need to, and that's why I like Blur as well, is just, it's a good training ground for teaching yourself like how to do things quicker and also whatever it takes to get the job done. So when you come from the film background, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to build this um, routine pipeline of how I'm going to do things, and essentially I'll, I'll try and automate a few tools to do it. Um, but when you work on like 30 effects for one project, and you know you've got limited resources in that situation you're more likely to um, look at okay well what's the simplest way to get this done because I know it was so weak it's really interesting talking to them and saying that like 400 shots to knock out in 10 days yeah, and that's right. stuff like that and again um, as long as you're doing the consistent work then that can get done but if it's 400 completely different shots right. then it's going to be a lot more work and you're going to be doing random whatever it takes to get the job done kind of thing. So I noticed on the show that I'm currently working on, I've been rendering out the core look of what I want for, like, let's say, like a big slow motion smoke pillar. Um, I haven't worried about fire or lighting or very specific stuff, more getting the overall look I wanted, and then from there I'd go on the comp and I'd build like rim lighting around the smoke. Um, I'd add my own fire into the comp. Um, I'd add like haze and just start color correcting and get all the additional look I want inside the comp. Right. Because the good thing is that then I can make an iteration of that and make another different lighting setup and a different look and spit out several variations based on the one element. Um, yeah, so you know, there's just ways that you can get a lot more control within the comp that you, if you did it in 3D, you'd be constrained to doing, you know, with that render you need to yeah, it takes it forever, right. Yeah. Yeah. I've learned that uh, <coughs> through this uh, process. It's probably best to show people mm -hmm. and composite it yourself and put it all together and see what the final product is going to look like mm -hmm. than showing up with the rendering passes. Some people just don't know what they're looking at. Well, that's always a debate. Um, I remember working like Fruit Loops commercial for Mexico when I was back in Australia in 2001. And I did like a bunch of animations in Maya. And I didn't hide any of the, uh, the helper objects like locators, stuff like that. And naturally, everyone's like, what are they doing in the shot? So you got to realize, you got to essentially evaluate who you're communicating with and what they're able to understand and expect from you. Um, I still get clients who you give them a grayscale play blast, yeah. and they're like, where's the color? You know? right. So it's just a matter of kind of like communicating to them. That's why I always recommend like nursing. If you're going to show someone something, you're going to think that they'll understand what they're looking at it's better for you to bring them to your table and give them a presentation rather than um, email or something and let them interpret it themselves. Right. Um, that way you can say, look, what we're looking at is specifically the time. Uh, the animation everything else is not in there right now. It's specifically hitting the beats that you want and the placement of like, the effect or whatever. And that way they can go, okay, well, if I'm just looking at that, then this is good. But if I'm looking at the animation, then it's all too light or whatever, you're like, right. cool, well, I haven't done that yet because I'm waiting for you to prove this stuff. Um, Sometimes yeah. uh, communicating through email is not enough. You have to go tap the person on the shoulder and make sure that they understand clearly that, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a slap pop or it's
it's, you know, something rough and you're just looking for specifics because um, communicating through email, some people get lazy and don't read it. Some people will see if you write too much, they, they just, you know. Well, that's exactly what I was going to say is that my experience is that if you email someone something, then nine times out of ten, they're just going to be like, whatever, click on the attachment. Right. Um, and then they'll be like, what the hell? And then you got to say, did you read the email? Right. So animation and thought we were, we were going to talk about that at some point. So what was your experience? I was just talking to a friend of mine, um, Rosalind, today, and she's you know, saying how she's loving animation mentor what she's doing uh, acting for animation we're about to start that oh yeah yeah and she's yeah I was so she's like, at a fourth term I think uh, probably oh. she's been doing it for quite a while now but um we got like a two page letter from her email from her so I'm just going to skim through it at this point but it's um yeah it's, it's interesting because I, I hear nothing but great feedback about AM yeah from everyone both instructors like Andrew Gordon all the guys at Pixar um, as well as from students who are responding to these people. Right. Yeah, yeah um, Animation Mentor is probably the best way to do online school. You know, they have uh, direct feedback, you know, uh, interactive with students. You can uh, critique anybody, you can look at anybody's work, and you learn off of these lectures that they give you. Mm. And it's just an awesome thing, because you get that one-on-one -on -one feel without going to a school, actually going to the studio mm. and uh, they'll teach you from their experience you know what a pipeline is and animation um, how they work with the uh, riggers and the director and how they um, block out their shots it's really cool and some some teachers even bring back their shots and break down break it down for the students I had a teacher that showed us uh, over the hedge and he broke down his break uh, his uh, blocking then his uh, spline, and then his final animation. And just seeing that process, you know, shine a new light on my, you know, in my eyes. And it was awesome. It, it made me a lot faster and a lot better at posing. Yeah, no, that's what I find interesting, because you can actually contact and speak directly with uh, your instructors too. Yeah. Right? So on the phone as well? Or? So you get, uh, some instructors will give you, like, the uh, their phone numbers or their emails, and you can hire them. But uh, one, one day out of the week, you get a two-hour session, I believe it's two hours, uh, with this uh, instructor, and uh, you get a QA, and a so you get to ask questions, he'll teach you what the lesson is for that week, and then you can go over stuff, and then if there's times, uh, some instructors will actually do a walkthrough. He'll show you his monitor, and he'll walk you through like, That's how great. he does certain things. That's great. Yeah. Um, one of my teachers from Sony Imageworks, he actually showed us a bunch of the shortcut stuff that he does and how to set it up. Mm -hmm. So we, by the end of his class, we all had like his shortcut keys and he was telling us how to animate stuff. It was really cool. That's cool. Actually, I think it's really good that you're able to like look at someone, like actually view their desktop and, okay, here's that work because right. it's the closest you'll be able to get to looking over their shoulder while they work. Right. And, uh... Another thing is that animation, uh, well, digital animation is so important to see what's under the hood, like mm. the spline, you know, what's happening in the spline. And not a lot of people show you that. They show you the, you know, what's happening afterwards and what's mm. rendered and, you know, the beauty passes. And that's great and all, but I want to see your splines. I want to see how you blocked it out. Is there any curves that, you know, that went crazy and it actually worked out for you? Mm. And uh, that's what uh, Animation Mentor brought in, was that a lot of uh, the teachers would show you how they were working in their uh, outliner. And it was just like, okay. And in their outliner or the graph? Oh, uh, uh, sorry, the graph. The graph editor. Yeah. See, I like that. Whenever I speak, like uh, I say words, and someone's going to repeat it off to me, they always say, I'm going to say it. So I was saying tomato or banana, and people were like, yeah, so you want uh, a banana, a uh, banana. So you, you said graph. Graph, I know. <laughs> you got me! That's right. Um, no, it's really interesting. I mean, I remember I worked with Alex Blake. He's one of the, um, I don't know where he is now. I'm, I'm going to guess he's like an animation suit an animal or somewhere. I know he's on Happy Feet at some point. Um, I remember I worked with him about 10 years ago, and we're doing a pitch for Max Steel, which at the time was one of those SGI uh, type, well, maybe it was a lightweight uh, TV series uh, shows. Um, so what I, what I found interesting with him, because I was actually animating on that show, because uh, I was kind of like, I was doing effects, and I'm like, 
No, I want to do character animation as well. So I'm like, nice. you know, because I've been doing character animation for games, which was uh, run cycles and loops and things where you're not dealing with several characters interacting. And right. that was like uh, my first show. I'd really kind of animated characters and done all that. So um, it's a bit of a learning curve because as soon as you get like several people interacting yeah. with each other, it's just like, wow, you know, you got to balance things all. Effects. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but what I found interesting with him was that he would use animation curves initially. He would literally just get all his key poses just down pat. Yeah, everyone's cutting their lawns to uh, Hulk cutting the beach. <laughs> um, so he would literally cut uh, in the key poses, and then later he would go on between it and do all the actual animation curves. Right. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I don't know whether I would necessarily do that, but um, Priest, which I just finished up, that to me was interesting because it was the first show in probably 10 years where I actually did animation on it as well. Because we went through all these dynamic simulations, and I was like, I don't know, like, there's a bunch of bikes that would ride through the desert, and you know, there was no one on it, so it would eventually, you know, fumble around and then tumble, break. And, you know. uh, so that was interesting because I would animate the whole thing, and I'd start to really mess around, like, spend more time working my curves and trying to get it all, right. like, you have to get the weight, and the fact that no one is got it, you would, you know, go around. You know, lose control and eventually yeah. tumble. They say the um, hardest animation is to animate something that has no control, like yeah. a drunk, a drunken person, right? Um, dancing, because mm -hmm. you know your body's flailing, flailing, yeah. flailing around. So those are the two hardest things, and you know, like an out of control bike, you know, because you can do that a thousand different ways. I did. <laughs> there you go. Oh, exactly. Yeah, but it was fun. It That's was awesome. It was a lot of challenging work. But yeah. It was great because it was something new opposed to, you know, everyone's like, where's all the effects? I'm like, well, I get this all down pat. And then from there, once I got the final animation where I liked it, I would then get to the point where I would make a dynamic simulation. So it eventually would, I'd make it tumble. And as it went from the final tumble, that's where I switched to dynamic simulation. And all those big key pieces would then break off and tumble and fall apart. Awesome. Then from there, I'd plug in this massive, particle system that I built that would create all these collisions, bits of geometry breaking away, explosions, and the whole thing turned out really cool because essentially the bike would go crazy, tumble, and then as it breaks it would tumble more and each piece would hit the ground, it would kick up dirt, it would kick up lighter dust, um, it would kick up metal bits exploding everywhere, and glass, you name it. Oh, awesome. The whole thing was procedural, so I wasn't ever uh, worried about um, Doing, I, I was never worried about the effects part because that was something I just like turn on a button and then it has effects and that would all take care of itself. Right. But getting to that point, like all the key animation, that to me was more crucial. You know? right. Right. Yeah, you can't you can't finalize an uh, an effect shot without the key animation being done. Mm -hmm. you know? It's like, well, yeah. What am I gonna what, what am I gonna use for Matt? What am I gonna use for reference? That's Are the cameras gonna be changing? That's an interesting subject, just because um, uh, you do get so many people who are like, like I, I've worked on shows where Bioshock, when I worked, I, I came on to direct the commercial in New York, and yeah, that was an interesting show. I was more of kind of supervising, like I did all the effects, I was helping with hiring and writing the treatment, you name it. And um, that was interesting because originally I worked on the trailer for Blur, and we won a game trailer of the year, the massive thing that we did, and we worked it really well. Then I worked on the cinematics for it, and I'd already swore I'd never go near the, the stupid thing because I was sick of it after Blur. It was a, right. it's a bit of a nightmare. There's a lot of work. And uh, so then I got flown to New York to do this thing, and I told them straight up, like, I shouldn't be going on this because they're starting on this date and they're finishing on this date and I need to leave like halfway through to go on to direct this other thing. So halfway through, oh, you know, basically I figured there's no way we can get to the end, end of the show to actually do all the effects. And um, so they were like, oh, we'll still hire you, come on, like, come on board, we really want to get, you know, jump on the show. I, I kept saying no because it's pointless me coming in where there's no animation even done. They can't create all the effects, right. and they're like, "Well, no, 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 we'll we'll work it out." So I flew over there, and um, naturally, you know, there none of the animation was approved or anything. And 
Uh, so, you know, I build all the effects, but then you can be tweaked out front left, and, you know, you get someone else to jump on your stuff and fiddle with the controls. It goes from looking cool to not looking cool. But what was interesting, though, was it's kind of like a lot of people just assume, oh, do all your effects, and we can just add them in later. Yeah, apply them in. And that, to me, that's like doing cloth simulations before you have the character model to even in all the animation. It's like, well, what am I going to do with them? You know, oh, we'll just do it, and we'll... Yeah, stick figure? Yeah. Like, well, the clock's going to change. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. That, that's the thing, there's a linear process in how you work. Right. Pre-production is going to be map painting, blocking stuff out while you're doing also the modeling. Um, once it gets to that stage, then you can look at doing all the rigging and all the, the look dev and, you know, animation after that. And as animation is getting done, you can start looking at pre preliminary lighting and then finally the shot. Uh, where in that stage you're moving into effects, cloth sims, hair, compositing, and final look down, like finishing shots. And, you know, and if you don't do it in that fashion, then things are going to you know, have to be redone because they're not going to be final. So, yeah, exactly. yeah, so that's interesting about AM. Um, I'll show you again, just bring that uh, friend I mentioned before, because I just find it interesting because now we're on the subject. Um, just having that conversation a minute ago. Um, but yeah, she was saying that she's learning, this ties back into what we were talking about earlier uh, about communication. Um, she was saying that she's learning to have to write, ask the right questions because you only get a, a certain amount of time yeah, to speak yeah. to someone. You need to get all the information you need out of them. So she's saying that now she's learning to actually ask the, the right questions that she needs to get the most information, extract the most information. Um, and that, that is it. Like if you have a meeting with a client, you need to get all the information because you don't want to then go down the wrong path because you didn't ask the right things later on. So the better idea that you have as to what someone wants, then the better you can, you know, you get a clear idea and go down the right path. This doesn't sound where I'll work and I'm like, all right, look, I know this is going to look silly, but this is what I know that they'll want, so I'll do it. You know, rather than, I'll I'll do what I think is cool, even though I know that they like whatever. So at the end of the day, it's not your product, it's whatever the client wants to pay for, right? So you can be as creative as you want, but yeah. you're going to be fighting a situation. What's the thing? I mean, you can get in positions where, um, really sure. um, you can be in situations where you can get into more creative control uh, or role and communicate better with the client. And in certain situations, it's good if you get better at communicating with them. You can say, look, I know this is what you want, but this is also something else I did. The reason I did this is because it's a bit more, a bit more impact. Um, you know, I think your idea is great too, but um, which one do you prefer? They might have their ego and say, well, I like mine better. Or they might say, hey, I um, actually like yours better. They'll entrust you more at that point. Right. The more you build that relationship. I worked on uh, the first ever silent commercial. Um, the director was Rob DePere, and um, he became, or was, and became a bigger, more famous um, director for car commercials. And about five years later, uh, I flew back to Australia. I was working for a place in Melbourne, and we're doing a Citroen commercial. And you know, he's like, you know, calling me down the phone, so he's like, "Hey, Alan, what do you think of this?" I'm like, "Well, you know, maybe we change this, this, and this." And because I had built up a relationship, I was communicating heavily with him five years ago. Not only did he remember me, but he had a lot of trust in what I was doing. So suddenly I was you know, sitting there in certain sessions, um, influencing the direction of the show because you had built up that whole yeah. rapport. Um, a buddy of mine, uh, Francis, used to be one of the uh, concept artists at Blur. He ended up working with uh, Guillermo del Toro. And you know, they communicate real well, they're both from the same city, Mexico City. So, you know, basically they became like really tough friends and um, Francis came to him and said, hey, I have this really cool idea for Hellboy 2. And he gave him the whole pitch and Grandma was like, well, I'm actually about to do Hellboy 2, but that looks like Hellboy 3 right there, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, Grandma actually started giving him a lot of his shows he was directing to Francis to actually direct back in Mexico City. That's cool. So, Again, you can build up this, this whole communication and communicate with people. Yeah. Um, looking at, uh, there's a guy I worked with on Blade, who was just talking about, I'm, 
it, the way I consider it, it's like if you're being hired to do a job, unless someone asks you, you know, to, to give feedback and give your own influence, you're essentially being hired to paint a house or something. You know, you're essentially being hired to do a specific task, and that's what you're meant to do. It's not about well, I disagree. I've had people I've worked with where clients said, "Oh, we like it all. We just want you to change this," and the certain person was like, "No, that's my signature." thing that I do, I'm not changing it, you know, and then it's like, they're literally being, on the verge of being fired because they're not willing to change that, you know, it's right. like, well, no, you do that, and as on Blade, we had a guy who, we had the, um, this change towards the end of the show where all the effects were looking great, and then, uh, David Goyer, the director, was like, there's something missing, and we sat with compositors and came up with this term that was, what was now dubbed lens flare contamination. Do you remember that? Yeah. So that was essentially where the screen would flare up yellow. And it wasn't like hitting brights, it wasn't like blowing out colors, it was just literally you'd have this yellow blob on the screen. So it didn't look too amazing, but, you know, that was his call and he loved it. He was like, that's it, lens flare contamination. I'm, I'm like, you know, going to be the, the, you know, doing the, the next um, board time. You know? Yeah. So the thing is that there was a certain artist we worked with who, again, great, really talented guy, but I guess he gets, and I don't blame him, really emotional about his work and he wants to look the best he can, which is totally, I completely agree with. But yeah, he took it kind of personally. He's like, you know. Yeah, you can't I put that on my shot. Yeah, I refuse to, <laughs> help, you know, like to do that. But again, in that situation, that's where you take it a fork. You know, you, yeah, you, you go, back. yeah, well, I'll, I'll go and I'll do what he wanted me to do. And we'll get it done, and we'll keep the client happy. But then, if I want from my reel, if you're worried about your reel, you can then go on and get the compositor to spit out one without the, you know, yeah. <laughs> magic finishing touch. So I mean, at that stage, you can always comp your own stuff. Exactly. Uh, I've got friends who do comp what the client wants, and then they make their own comp, and they do it how they think that it should look. So yeah. that's cool. Yeah, it's just uh, that way everyone's happy. You get your stuff. And so, again, I just going to figure it's worth mentioning because we already have kind of given a bit of a plug, but how's uh, all the Crazy Eights stuff coming along? Like, it's coming good. Uh, we should have the website running up and running soon um, by the time this is aired. So we'll have uh, motorbillyboogie.com up and running and selling shirts. And and it's going to work. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, uh, we have our women flying from that, so. Yeah, you mentioned you're doing a few more shows. I actually saw one of the new designs yeah. yesterday. We have, uh, we, we're working on a couple more designs, so. That's great. Yeah, that's cool. cool. It's really good. And uh, you're thinking about maybe going over to work on, I won't, we won't say what, but um, yeah, maybe going to Zoic yeah, a little bit. Yeah, thinking about going to Zoic to work on a couple of shows. And mm -hmm. uh, it should be fun. Yeah, we'll work some on pretty big stuff in there. So. Yeah, work on a new pipeline. Yeah, man, that's good. What's your take on, like, using Max and Meyer and, like, having a cross-platform? Because that's an interesting subject in itself. Like, I've, I use them all and deal with this in a lot of different places, but right. you've got a lot of interesting experiences with dealing with this currently, where you're using Max and using Maya together yeah. and FBX and Point Oven and all these other uh, tools as well. Right, see... It is interesting, but the thing is, is that we're not using the, the newest technology. We're using Maya 9 to cross-platform to Max 10. However, yeah. FBX, um, I will say FBX is up to date. So even though you are using Maya, Maya 2009 and not 2011, the FBX plugin itself yeah. uh, is identical with all of them. So it's not like cool. they've done something in 2011 that's going to make it more stable or anything. Yeah, well, I was hoping that they would. Well, look, it's, it's cross-platform all the way to 2008 through 2011. It's all the same tool. They release it, right. um, excuse me, all at the same time. Um, it's just that uh, certain things work better with older versions, like mm -hmm. uh, the cameras. When you're exporting cameras from Maya, um, it's better to use uh, the FBX uh, setting on the bottom for 2008. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because uh, for some reason, the cameras just come in better into Max that way. I found yesterday, Geometry came in 2006, FBX apparently works better than 
2011. Exactly. And then uh, there's all kinds of different things that you can do in Maya to to get it right to in Max or to screw it up to get it into Max. Like uh, what's ge- geocaching. Geocaching works sometimes, but there's there's a trick to it, and it's not as easy as just hitting the button saying okay geocache, because there's no translation and rotation scale on geocaches, so you have to duplicate geocaches. Right. Um, use, a, use a blend shape, blend shape it to the original uh, shape and morph it into it, and then it duplicates it with the translation and all that information, and then you can geocache it. We had, we had that at a priest, because um, essentially what's happening is when you're outputting point information, it's all... And essentially, it's in local space because it's it's all relative to itself. But then it's reading off the parent. So if you have a parent moving around, all the geometry is based on that. So, um, in other words, if you do all the point cache information, the point information will come across. But you might, you know, your character might be standing uh, several meters in the wrong position. Right, definitely. Um, and same thing if you're outputting objects in local space, which is how all the packages usually work. Um, then when they come in, if you want to rotate something or whatever, it, it's pivot is going to be all screwed up. Right. So usually what we were doing towards the end, because I was tearing my hair out uh, trying to get... Actually, here's the interesting thing. I, was, I spent an entire week accumulatively trying to get Maya and Max to talk to each other. And Max was up to date, whereas Maya, I didn't update the plugin. And then all it turned out to be was that Maya was reading the information incorrectly because it didn't have the latest FBX. Um, but that being said, we wrote all these tools on both ends to um, deal with all this old wrote sort of crunch down, prepare and clean online geometry so that way it was the best it could be for exporting. Uh, at the same time in Maya when they're exporting stuff out, it would beg it all to uh, world space rather than local space. So that way everything's baked out to like zero 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 world space. So it's completely and absolutely in the correct positions where it should be, rather than relying and being relative to something else around. So there's a few things like that, but in my experience, everyone who's been successful in getting my Max to talk to each other has boycotted FBX and used just OBJs to export everything, and then point cache uh, information to read it all in the other package. So that way it's all world-space geometry caching. And, um, you know, you just forget FBX because it's trying to do too much. Exactly. Uh, point, uh, point of it is a, a tool that you can use to actually point cache in Maya and bring it back into Max or Lightwave or mm. other packages. Um, I haven't played around with it too much, but, you know, it should work in theory. <laughs> but anything where you're uh, baking down the verts is probably a better choice than uh, going with Filmbox because FBX it, it wants to bring all this data in, like uh, blend shapes, um, skinning, yeah, bones, all this, everything. yeah, all this extra data that you really just don't need. Well, you shouldn't be like you. You shouldn't need all the like. You're not going to reanimate like and half your animation in Maya and then tweak it in Max or something. It right, but even if you select the geometry, it'll bring in. That's what I found with uh, it still brings it in. It still brings it in. It wants to bring in the parent. It wants to bring in uh, anything in the hierarchy. Even if it's just a, a couple of faces, it'll bring in uh, the whole bone set. Mm. That's something I'm interested in doing a bit of, is actually um, doing like a live broadcast. Because one of the best masterclasses I ever taught at Autodesk, like for Autodesk at SIGGRAPH, was that I taught like a digital pyrotechnics, I think I called it, um, a fume workshop, a masterclass. And, um, then that same week, one of my buddies was teaching a masterclass and he had some visa issues coming to the US. So Lisa Raleigh over at Autodesk was like, Alan, can you fill in and take care of, that, of his uh, masterclass as well? So I said, I'll do it, but I'm not preparing. Uh, I'm just going to walk in and do whatever. So I went in there and just kind of like disclaimer. Uh, I think uh, David, oh, I've forgotten his name now, it's been a while. Well, anyway, one of the guys at our desk introduced me and said, Alan's not going to, hasn't prepared at all, so bear with him. But I literally just went on stage and said, what do you guys want to learn? And to me, that was interesting because people were like, okay, well, how would I create like a, you know, uh, a BAMF effect from X-Men? I'm like, all right, well, you know, build your object, um, 
you know, build up these layers, you know, layer them together. Okay, well, how do we do a nuke? How do we do this? Like, how would you do, uh, how do you handle water? And it was just a, a inst instant feedback, like, well, I've interactive way of, of uh, teaching, and, like, it was great, because people got what they wanted out of it, and, um, yeah, it actually worked out really well. Uh, I was going to say, Brandon Davis and I actually talked about doing that at one stage, just doing, like, the two of us on stage, and people would be like, how do you do this? And we'd just go, okay, we'll do it this way. So um, that is, like, a really good way to communicate, you know. Yeah, definitely, because uh, you never know what uh, those people want, you know what I mean? Yeah. One person might want fire, one person might want something totally completely different. Right? That's right, that's yeah. right. So, um, you know, it, it definitely is a good way to approach that'll be, it. Yeah, that would be interesting. Just like I said uh, about animation, seen under the hood, you know? Mm. Like, it's in, like when you show me some stuff, I'm interested in seeing what you have in your flowchart, not, not in the actual explosion. It's like, oh, okay, that's the result, but how did you mm. get there? So, well, it's true. It's yeah. cool. Um, some people, you know, I used to... I think the first DVD I ever released, I focused more on the, the particle side of it than I did on the rendering. Mm -hmm. So everyone's like, cool, I, I know how to do particles, but how do I render these now? You know, like, right. and that yeah, is that yeah, a whole new subject altogether. And then how do you render them out as passes to get it all out? And then how do you composite it all? You know, um, that's what I'm doing right now with the live action workshop I'm running. Um, because we start out, I actually get people to paint visualize what they want because that's, awesome. that's one thing I, I hate watching people do is they'll go okay you know I'm going to go and do this effect they'll literally start tinkering around and building this complex thing before they actually have an idea as to what they want and then they're so deep into it they're like well this is kind of like the, the approach I had to go for now so uh, you, you figure out um, what you want ahead of time you know you've got a solid idea as to what you want at the time and then you're doing it is going to be so usually I'll get a play blast and I'll paint like four or five keyframes and that's something either I can communicate to the client or to my supervisor and say this is the style I'm going for, is this the right size, all that kind of stuff. They might say I want more fire here. You can literally get that feedback um, a, little, a little better, more efficiently. Um, at the same time, it doesn't need to be shown to anyone. It can be for you internalize what you want to do. Right. And then from there, begin to build it up and you do an animatic or whatever and you keep going that process and you never need to backtrack then rather than going in the complete wrong direction or whatever. So that's that's like one thing I've always found like some people go on like write some freaking tool all day long instead of doing their job and you're like, dude, just all I have to do is like these big sparks, you know, and yeah. now you go on and created a spark tool and it doesn't work. <laughs> so yeah, I, um, I remember you showing that in the, your helicopter tutorial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was great to see that you did that because uh, that was the first time that you know you show you showed that process, and it was just interesting. That it was like, wow, this is actually how he approaches it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I started doing that probably in two thousand four. I think it were I started doing that a bit, and you know, some people would be like, "What the hell are you doing? Like painting?" You know, Explosions. Yeah, yeah but I'm, I'm like, dude, well, now I've got a better idea as to what I want. It's a blueprint, right? It's, yeah. They tell you to block out your stuff for animation. They tell you to storyboard your stuff yeah. before you make a movie. It's the same thing. And that's the, the biggest thing I see in effects is that so many people learn to hit all the right buttons. They don't really learn all that stuff that comes with it. And I think that's good that a lot of people from like back in the 90s, they came from being a generalist. Or anyone who comes from being a generalist and then getting into their craft, right. they take all that knowledge with you, up right. with them. And so they end up learning about, you know, they, I, I'll never say I'm like a great animator, but I do understand, you know, about timing, anticipation, and weight distribution, and, and getting the, the right beats that you need to, to make something look good. And, and all of that applies to the effects I do, and I need to, you know, be able to visualize, okay, well, I need this to happen, and I need to hit here, and I need it to expand there, and then this happens and that. And, you're, if you understand that, then you can get a better effect. You can communicate better with your director or whoever. Um, I think it's all really crucial. It's severely overlooked. You know, but that's been really good. Um, thanks again for taking the time to try to run to Nevada or California with me. Yeah, no worries. And uh, no, this has been really good. So, uh, you know, appreciate. Hope it. this is helpful for somebody out there. <laughs> Dude, I'm sure I'm going to find it really interesting just to check out. So, uh, cool. Yeah, man. No, thanks again. I really appreciate it. All right. Peace out.